Hey, haven't seen you guys in a while. Welcome back to the Cinemologists. Let's talk about 1950s science fiction, shall we? It's something which today many people look at and immediately scoff. But why? Their associations are probably no more than the occasional really low budget film they saw on MST3K or late night cable. Or is that not even a thing people do anymore? A lot of science fiction films in the 1950s did not have the largest budget because, frankly, sci-fi wasn't taken completely seriously back then. Most often, studios would realize the spectacle potential in science fiction, but wouldn't invest that much money into the project, only banking on a small profit. In 1951, Robert Wise's The Day the Earth Stood Still, there was good emphasis placed on the special effects and the story and characters. Science fiction was not a very prominent genre until the 1950s, in the post-war period, when the public was given examples of the harsh reality of science and its widespread effects. Sci-fi was brought in as sort of a magic mirror of society and the ills that plague it. The stories were most often cautionary in nature, though with a healthy dose of bug-eyed monsters thrown in. The first real alien invasion movie, where the invaders were truly sinister, was Howard Hawke's The Thing from Another World. Suddenly, outer space was not such an optimistic place. Yet, science fiction was not always optimistic, not even back when H.G. Wells wrote The War of the Worlds in 1897. Back then, Wells was commenting on British colonists conquering an indigenous population and then being killed off by disease. This he adapted into The Martian's Death by Terrestrial Bacteria. Eventually, Orson Welles played what is probably the biggest prank of all time on America on Halloween in 1938 by broadcasting a highly convincing production of War of the Worlds. From then on, the story was indelibly planted into the popular consciousness. It was only a matter of time before a film was made. Originally, Ray Harryhausen had done animation tests for a version he proposed. However, it was Paramount who eventually produced the picture. Yet, getting the film greenlit was indicative of the period's attitude towards the genre. Don Hartman, not caring a hoot about science fiction, said, oh, this is where this belongs, and threw it in the waste paper basket. Well, poor Mr. Powell, I mean, he came unglued. He absolutely lost his mind. He leaped across the desk, and he grabbed him by the lapels. He was going to strangle the man. Fortunately, the film got off the ground, and what a film it is. For a movie which begins in a small town, its scope spreads to encompass the entire world, very successfully. The drama of the film coming from this sense of doom and foreboding. It begins with a slow examination of the solar system being mostly unfit for life. Narrated by Sir Cedric Hardwick, the mysterious scoring by Leith Stevens, and the wonderful paintings by Chesley Bonestell create a sense of the awe and strangeness of the cosmos. It did not occur to mankind that a swift fate might be hanging over us or that from the blackness of outer space we were being scrutinized and studied. Gene Barry and Anne Robinson play the leads. Years before James Cameron popularized romance set against disaster, this film set a notable precedent. Gene Barry, fresh from another Atomic Age thriller, The Atomic City, plays scientist Dr. Clayton Forrester. His spouting some scientific dialogue is all he makes of his profession in the movie, but he is quite good as a leading man and is properly desperate later on in the film. In fact, his priorities shift from being excited about the Martians and their technology to risking his life to find Sylvia, which brings us to Anne Robinson. One of the things I most remember about this movie was that she screamed. <laughs> She screams so loud we even see her tonsils at one point. However, I sort of like her character. She's a genuinely caring person, as we see her as a Red Cross volunteer, and later she tends to Jean Barry. Anne Robinson herself in interviews is full of life and has great recollections about the production. I did get to go on stage 18 and watch them glide. It was silent. And these magnificent copper machines were just gliding above you all you know, across the soundstage. It was quite eerie and very, very impressive. Portraying the global crisis is not something easily accomplished. In this movie, it is really palpable, and I think this comes from the fact that early on we are shown people in mass having a good time or hanging out together. Then we see shots of people fleeing from the invasion, and having that with the music creates a mood which is lingering and stayed with me after the film. In the book, the Martians are not invulnerable outright, and one of their tripods is destroyed. However, to cement the futility of the war, these Martians are given force fields which can even protect against an atomic bomb. After that scene, we really sense the oncoming doom. It didn't stop them. Guns, tanks, bombs, they're like toys against them. It'll end only one way. We're beaten. 
The film was directed by Byron Haskin, a veteran of the silent age. I visualize. Booney, come here. I visualize the scene. Haskin brings that visual sensibility to many of the scenes, and must have liked the design of the Martian war machines so much he reused them in Robinson Crusoe on Mars. Haskin's capable direction is visible in the scene in which three unfortunate men witness the Martian heat ray rise from the meteor. The scene is staged pretty brilliantly, with the only dialogue coming in hushed tones from the onlookers. The shifting light with the rising of the cobra-like apparatus. A lot of silence is employed or minimal use of sound, which is punctuated by the unforgettable effects of the heat ray itself, pinging and blinking. When I was a kid, this was simultaneously awe-inspiring and frightening, laced with a sense of dread. Haskin takes his time with this scene, drawing the audience, like the impending victims, in. Finally, the payoff of the scene is an interjection of an unmistakably sinister ringing, followed by a truly awesome sound and visual effect. The former was achieved by reversing the sound of an electric guitar. Probably the most memorable thing about this film is the production design. It took some exceptional designs on the Martian craft and the Martians to lodge themselves in the minds of people. The manta ray craft are timeless and beautifully menacing. Since the models were built out of copper, they have a sheen to them. Also, a fault in the special effects actually adds something. The blue screening in some shots is reflected on the copper surfaces or still has a thick outline. When I was a kid, I didn't understand blue screening and thought that was just another otherworldly effect. Speaking of special effects, this film deservedly won that respective Oscar. And shots like this, where the Martians are letting loose in full fury while being heavily bombarded, are wonderful to look at, all the more so because of the three-strip Technicolor. Most ingenious was the heat ray, which composited an acetylene torch being blown outward. Probably the most ambitious effect of the film is the appearance of a single Martian in the destroyed farmhouse. It was operated at great risk since the construction of the thing was falling apart while they were filming. However, with minimal lighting on it and those throbbing veins, its brief appearance is pretty creepy. When the arm of a dying Martian is seen at the end of the film, the throbbing veins are used to dramatic effect. That, along with a simple lighting change, and the audience knows what's going on. The ending in this version is the most effective in my opinion, since all around the main characters, things are crumbling and then silence. Once it's established that the Martians are dead, the victory is more satisfying since their threat was so great and man's efforts were so futile. This more spiritual side to the ending, having it occur at a church, comes from George Powell and one of his early puppet tunes in which a similar ending takes place. Powell also portrays the priest in the film more sympathetically than Wells did in the book. It's part of what make Powell's productions so memorable. They have heart and soul to them, especially this in The Time Machine. In an age full of remakes and reboots, this is one story which I actually think should be remade. The story is naturally timeless and never will go out of style. Its applicability makes it necessary to retell for new generations. These versions often play off of the fears and vulnerabilities of that time. Orson Welles saw how he could exploit and criticize people's taking everything they hear on the radio as fact. George Powell obviously played off of the fear of the Soviet Union invading. The short-lived 1988 TV series, with the aliens revived through toxic sludge and their ability to take over human bodies, Bodies, seemed to come right from the AIDS panic. In 1953, aliens started taking over the world. Today, they're taking over our bodies. Finally, Steven Spielberg's version, with its tagline, They're Already Here, and the presentation of the invasion, is right in the collective conscious wake of 9-11. Pretty soon, we'll likely see a new incarnation of our story, perhaps responding to the growing reliance on technology and social media in our daily lives. This is Alex Latanzi of The Cinemologist saying, Keep watching the skies! Rotsman! Bilderbeck!